Did somebody have their hand up? Okay. Um, there's a little question in regards to, um, I suppose, as you were saying, that you lived before your birth and you lived again after your death. But earlier you were saying that your identity, yourself, stays the same throughout your body's lifetime. Like you might have a sex change, for example, but you are still you. So what is it about your life before your body birth and your life afterwards that, that is still you? The yogic teachings, they describe what the experience of death is like for a person that has no spiritual understanding. It is an experience of tremendous fearfulness and of great pain because we are being removed from everything that is important to us, everything we're deeply attached to. And it describes also that the process of growing within the womb, particularly in the last three months, and then the actual experience of birth. I mean, have you ever seen a baby being born? It's far out. It's like getting squeezed out of a toothpaste tube. You know. <laughs> and these violent contractions that, that the baby is subjected to. And it's described that the effect that it has on the individual, those two things, is that it practically erases almost all of the memory of, of previous experience. But you'll notice that every single person that is born comes into this world with specific types of abilities and talents that are natural to them a specific level of intelligence, a specific type of beauty or lack of beauty. And it is described that all of these things are connected to and carry on from previous experience. In the Vedic teachings, I mean, try to picture this. This will probably be a little bit shocking. You know, when, when a baby is born and somebody's a mother's holding or a father's holding the baby and it's so small and it's so beautiful and it's just like, it, people just lose it because it's just like, wow, it's so, and the smell of a baby, you know, and everybody's going like, oh. But about 10 months before, that little dude had a completely different body, one that you wouldn't want to hold <laughs> and smell and cuddle. <laughs> and what happens, you know, we think, oh, the child is just so innocent, you know, and pure. And it's not, it's not actually true that each child shows up with massive amounts of baggage. And that baggage will be unpacked during their life. And sometimes there will be bitter fruit that they must taste and sometimes sweet fruit. This has to do with what's called the laws of karma. That as you sow, so you shall reap that there will be things that come to you in your life 
unasked for. It's not like you can remember or you did something that, you know, and, but now you're in this situation. Some people are born with amazing ability and fantastic strength of body and health. Others are born with disability and tremendous poverty and difficult circumstance. It's all tied to what is called the laws of, of karma. But that's about as far as I want to go at this point. Um, and it, because it's a new idea and it's a standalone topic and subject, it's, we don't have enough time to adequately deal with it here. So I'm just going to say that it is a continuation that same person can adopt different types of bodies and become absolutely absorbed in the identity of that body as being me and live that life and that life in that body comes to an end and they can assume another body and another identity that goes with it. Spiritual liberation means that I come to understand my actual spiritual personality, my eternal personality, who I am, and begin to live that reality. So that may or may not answer your question. It's sort of showing you some of the things, but it's a really big topic. Maybe we can talk about that some other time. Is that okay? I mean, because these ideas might be just like radically new and different, it's okay. And, and we don't have to overly, you know, we don't have to look at those things. I mean, just look at the time that you'll spend in this body. And you can still appreciate the need for self-discovery, to really find yourself and to be able to fulfill these great spiritual need for happiness and for love. And your spiritual quest should be to that end. Because the material activity won't, won't deliver. It won't deliver what you seek. Anybody else? Um, can Rupa, can you put up the sound? Because the speakers are facing out that way, so I, I can't hear so well here. Yeah. You mentioned that spiritual need is love and giving. So we know that already. What is there to seek for anymore in? What is the? What else do we seek for in so-called spiritual exploration or finding your spiritual personality or characteristic? If we already know that in the end it's about love and giving, what are you looking for? Yeah, so can I just say we can understand perhaps that the need for happiness and for love is fundamentally a spiritual need, but to, to actually experience what that means and to be able to do the things that will make it so I can fulfill those needs, that is what the spiritual journey is about. It's not just an intellectual idea. I can say, oh, okay, I accept that or I understand that. But then I'm just going on doing all the same stuff, living the same way, without any actual realization 
of these things. So, I mean, the word, the word realization means it becomes a manifest reality rather than just being an idea. We actually experience the, the reality of that. And we develop a great spiritual vision the way in which we will look upon this world, the way in which we will look upon other people, the way in which we will look upon ourselves will, will completely alter in the most wonderful way. And with that will come a different set of values, what we value and what we feel to be important. And it will begin to change the way that we live. So this is all part of that spiritual journey. And as, that in, as the experience begins to unfold, as the way we see things begins to we, we develop that clarity, then it, it grows with, with increasing intensity. Okay? Anybody else? Um, any difference between what you are telling us yeah. and Muslims telling us or Christianity telling us? Okay, that's an Im important question. Um, I mean, everybody, I think, it inherently agrees and understands that to live a more spiritual life is good and to live a, a materialistic life is bad or not so good. But if you ask people to explain what is materialism and what is true spirituality, you will get a big variety of answers. We understand that the foundational principle of materialism is the idea that you are the body. You are something which is material when you are not. From that idea, all roads from it lead to hedonism. Hedonism is the idea that by fulfilling the desires of the senses and the mind, my body and mind, I can become fulfilled. And this is the purpose of existence. Whether people are overtly going there or in a bit of a windy route going there, that's where it all goes, the underpinning of materialism. The foundation of spirituality is the understanding that I am a spiritual being and everything that flows from that. A person can be deeply religious, but very materialistic. If people adopt an idea that is colored by materialism, then it is difficult to have full spiritual realization. For instance, if I accept that there is a God or some higher force or being or something, and if I have adopted the philosophy of materialism but are religious, 
then I will be asking God to fulfill all my material desires, to give me stuff, and to help me with my exams and with money and help me with my husband or wife or help me with this love relationship or, you know, we're just constantly asking for things that are of a material nature. Such a connection to God or some higher being is not inherently or deeply spiritual. It is colored with materialism. So true spirituality means that even though a person may adopt a particular system of faith or religion, they understand over and above everything that they are, I am an eternal spiritual being. We are all eternal spiritual beings. This is a big topic. I hope that is enough to show you the beginnings of the distinction. You are very welcome. Thank you for the question. Okay. I can't see where I got all these lights shining in my eyes. Huh? Okay. I've had a couple of people say that people choose their parents. That what? That people choose, choose, choose their, their parents. parents. Mm. And so if, for example, a baby comes into the world and the parents are physically and emotionally abusive or alcoholic or do you believe that if that is the case that it is karma, that that person was in a previous life um, not a good person needed to come in and have parents like that to as some sort of a punishment? Firstly, the the laws of karma we shouldn't think of in reality as being to do with reward and punishment. It's just a simple reality. If I've got a, a big ball, a bowling ball or something, and I'm standing on a hill that's going up and I try to roll it up the hill and it doesn't get over the top, it's coming back down to me. It's not like, you know, I deserved it. It's just following the, the laws of, of material nature. The laws of karma are intimately connected with the laws of material nature. And so when things happen, they are simply the consequences of choices that we make. You know, something we haven't talked about here, which is also an important part of the whole spiritual journey, so I'll just digress for one minute. Wherever you find yourself, you have to understand that wherever I am in life, it is the result of choices that I have made and actions that I have taken. And if I am not overwhelmingly happy with where I am, what I need to do is learn how to take control of my life and make brilliantly good decisions that lead to stunning outcomes. That is our responsibility as a human being. Animals cannot do this. Human beings can. It is true that wherever you are born, it is definitely connected with things that you have done and how you have lived in the past. But it is really important that it, it's more complicated than that. If we superficially accept the idea of karma and the laws of karmic reaction, it would become easy to say, well, that person 
deserved what they got. If we ever have that feeling, we are really far from any spiritual understanding. It's not like people deserve things and we can abandon them and not seek to help them, to help them in their life in, in all ways, not just spiritual ways, in terms of material things as well. We have an obligation as human beings to, to do that. So it is true that people born often in unfortunate circumstance, yes, there is some uh, actually very deep connection with past activity, past karma. But we should never ever feel that callous or think that somebody deserves something. No, we, we deserve to be spiritually enlightened. We deserve to experience true transcendental happiness, to experience spiritual love. That's what we deserve. These other things are all, all passing things. Okay.